Case, welcome back to the Just Get Started podcast. Good to have you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Good to be back. Full circle. It's been a long time, man. Um, I was just in the infancy of my first year doing this podcast, and uh, you were appreciative to jump on. So I, uh, I appreciate you coming back in. And it's it's always interesting to see. You know, I've been obviously following your journey since then and just kind of the things you've done, how you pivoted and grown. And you know, one of the things that's always interesting with folks that I kind of stick with that have been on the podcast um, is how they haven't given up. They've maybe not doing the exact thing they were doing back then, but they certainly have kind of learned what they want to do in life and kind of leaned into that a little bit more. So that's what I want to spend this time talking about in the conversation. Uh, so can you share a little bit about what maybe the last, so let's take like 2019 through today, like mm -hmm. what have you been kind of working on? What have been some of the things that you've maybe pivoted or changed since that time? Um, and, and how that's helped you, I guess, maybe lean in more to like a purpose and, and the things that you want to do. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, wow. So 2019, I mean, for one, then whenever we chatted, um, I was doing everything I'm doing now in an extent, but I was also working a full time job. So I think the biggest change from then to now, of course, is I, I left that job and I left that job almost, almost two years ago um, and moved into doing this full time. So, you know, that was the the big moment, I suppose, that everyone looks to and looks forward to the day they quit their their day job and get to do their their passion thing full time. Um, so I think that's the biggest change for me. I mean, that was kind of a gradual process for me. And it's one that I really look back on with gratitude that I didn't rush that process. I think it's so important. Like I am like a lot of people are like, oh, when it comes to entrepreneurship or building, like you're either all in or you're all out. And I think I suppose that mentality is true when it comes to what you do, like the thing that you create, but I don't think it's true within the scope of the, you know, the, the reality of, of finances and having a foundation. So I'm very grateful that I, I did these two things concurrently for so long um, and then left and had leverage when I left so that when I was continuing to build my business, what I do, my platforms, there was no desperation. There was no, oh, I've got to do this, that. I got to, I got to put food on the table. I've got to take this deal. I've got to do everything. So I'm really grateful for that, certainly. Um, and, you know, it was really, I, I think it's powerful to, to build from a place of patience because usually patience gives you, you know, more purity in, in the form of what you're building or your content. You could be more honest as opposed to, you know, doing things for dollars or doing things for scale and so on and so forth. So I think for me, that that's been the biggest thing since since 2019 is that big shift there. Um, but I mean, you know, a lot of it is the same. I mean, to your point about consistency, I'm approaching episode 500. So I suppose in 2019, whenever we talked in, in 2019, for me, I was probably less than 100 episodes in or 100 episodes or so in because I started the podcast in 2018, like in mid to late 2018. So 400 episodes later, um, I think when it comes to the craft and what I do, um, that's been really big. And I think also like the, the biggest thing I've realized is the compounding effect from the podcast. If we're talking about the podcast specifically, the, the compounding effect that comes from doing 500 episodes, because it's no longer about, all right, do an episode, publish an episode, move to your next episode. It isn't in, in practicality, but it's more so about what do I do with those episodes that I've released in the past? What do I do with the data? What do I do with my listenership feedback? And since then I've written five books, you know, a bunch of journals, I've created a bunch of products, I've created a ton of content. So for me, it's become this, this wheel of, you know, sit down, think very in depth about a topic, release a podcast, use that to then create something in the future, a book, a product, an idea. Um, so it's been this, this very compounding effect where it's not just do a podcast, move on to your next one. It's do a podcast and then use that in the future for something that continues to grow you. Um, and that's been really big. Like I, this morning I spent the last like five hours working on my next book, which is all just from the past four years of podcast. So I'm never like creating from zero anymore. The, the, the podcast for me is zero and I create from that. And then that fuels everything I do. Mm. Um, and that's been a big, um, kind of aha moment for me. Mm, I love that thought. Yeah. Cause when you think about like, well, I think it goes back to what you mentioned too, about not being pressured by money potentially. Cause that's where I think a lot of folks get pressured, right. Where they have to take the quick dollar and ultimately that veers them off the path like you've been doing um, with a, that consistency. And unfortunately, you know, you start going down these, these rabbit holes and you're like, oh my gosh, I haven't lost the podcast episode in three months. You know, I think we yeah. both have talked to people um, that have started podcasts well, you know, maybe after us that we started and then they've stopped it. 
already because yeah. of hey, they took the short term win maybe. And again, everyone just st- starts and stops. As I, I think you know, you, I've heard you say this as well. Like I always encourage people, like if you want to start a podcast, do it. Put in at least though like ten or twenty episodes. You may not like it after that, and that's cool. But why are you continuing? Like if you don't have that why in place, it's like really why start it in the first place? Yeah, like, it might be well, better yeah. the time. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the ultimate foundational question. Like, why are you doing anything? Is it because everyone else is doing it? Is it because it's, you know, something that is expected of you? Who knows? I think you've got to have a really personal why. I mean, for me, I always joke that, and it's not even a joke. I say that the podcast is my form of therapy because it really is. And I get so much value from my own podcast that, you know, even if no one listened anymore, uh, it would still benefit me and it would still give me things to write and create from. So there's so much value for me there. So it's never a forced thing that I have to do or I feel compelled to do. And I think, I think frankly, that's kind of rare. I think a lot of people struggle with that um, because the, the motivation to start something in the first place isn't as deep as we think it would be. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, I just, you know, I like talking with interesting people. Well, yeah, that's, that's a good starting point for a podcast, I suppose. But I think we need to find a layer deeper. Um, and then to your point, I think you need to commit to something. You need to say, I'm going to commit to a year's worth of podcasting once a week or twice a week or whatever it is. Because truly, especially in podcasting, which is very difficult, very difficult to grow. Um, you, you need to have a, a extreme layer of consistency there to, to look back on and say, okay, you know, I did what I said I was going to do. I released a bunch and it's either not working or it doesn't speak to me in the way that I thought it would, or I'm going to pivot and do version 2.0, but you got to give yourself something to react to. And that's why I think it's so important to, you know, at least commit to 20 episodes, 30, 40, 50, something like that. Well, and then real, I mean, realizing that it's not going to happen overnight. Like you're not just going to post five episodes and all of a sudden, you know, you're going to get like some massive sponsors and, a, you know, maybe someone picks you up or whatever on a big network yeah. or something like it. It doesn't happen like that. It's kind of thinking out. I, I was uh, I was talking with I think you were on Danny Miranda's podcast, and and him and I were talking recently about this whole thing of like thinking in decades. Like the, like I'm excited. Like when I launch episode one thousand and two thousand, and you know, like that'll be amazing. Because like okay, you put in ten or twenty years. Like because assuming podcasting is still going to be around then. So I think having that longer time horizon. To your point, it's like doing it because of that. Why ultimately you can quote unquote win if you're actually doing it for the long scale, if you're not looking at the long time horizon, you can't expect to just get randomly picked up. Yeah. And I, and I wouldn't blame people for quitting quickly if they don't have the why. And right. if they're comparing themselves from a place of lack, because my, I like, I'm a professional podcaster, which is very difficult to do. Like my podcast is signed with Sirius XM, which is also very difficult to do. It yeah. took me five years to get to this point, four years of which were just by myself. But I can pick up my phone right now and feel very defeated. <laughs> I can compare myself to any of the numerous, numerous, numerous bigger podcasts than me and feel very defeated easily. Yeah. And I'm in the, the top 0.01%. So like, imagine just getting started. Like, it's so easy to defeat yourself through comparison um, that, you know, for me, that's why I try to stay away from that kind of stuff. So I think, yeah, I think you have a powerful why that is like powerful, not just, you know, I want to impact a million people. I don't think that's powerful enough. I don't think that's self-centered enough. Like I talk a lot about the idea of compassionate self-centeredness, both in like relationships and in business. Like you have to start with yourself. It has to be there as humans. Like we're wired for that and we need to find that reason. And then along the way, you need to not compare yourself to other people, which is easier said than done. I saw that like, I think it was uh, on average, like 10% of our daily thoughts are devoted to comparison of some kind. There's hmm. a lot of thoughts. I think we've got like 10,000 thoughts a day. So you're saying a thousand thoughts a day are dedicated to comparing yourself. That's tough. So yeah. we've got, we've got to find a way to, uh, you know, sometimes escape the data, the money, the, the clout, whatever it is, and return back to that reason. And, um, you know, easier said than done, but I think if you lock that in, yeah, then you're absolutely looking at 10, 20 years, you know, large time horizons. One of the things, well, you actually mentioned this in, in a recent podcast you did, and, and I think that maybe this is a, we can kind of pin these together of this, that you talk about manifestation and this, uh, the, the, what I loved you, the way you said it was life reacts to what we do. And this comes back to, you can't just say, ah, I want a podcast or I want to write a book or I want to do whatever, or Hey, in time, I'll do that. You actually have to go out and create. So I'm, I'm curious your thoughts about how you've thought about creating and then also maybe whether it's practical advice or you can kind of go down whatever you know path you want of of how you put in the time to actually create. How do you actually structure your day maybe 
those type of things that are important to creating the habits to create. You can't just kind of randomly do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So I, I did release that episode on manifesting. I mean, that's a little tough love. Like I'm a pretty gentle mindfulness guy and I, I try to give people a lot of empathy and understanding. And, but at the end of the day, like you can't think yourself into what you want, whether that's the person you want to be or the business you want to build. Like you can't, you know, good things don't come from people with just positive intentions. I think there's something to be said about knowing what you want and having clarity. I think that is so, so, so important. Um, far more important than a lot of things. In fact, like the way that you execute maybe, but you still have to execute. You still have to do things. You still have to verb things. I think we've got this weird misunderstanding about manifestation mm. as a topic. Like the only reason I talk about this topic is because so many people talk about it. I just call it doing, but we like to dress it up and call it manifesting. But, you know, I think for some reason we skip a step. We think, all right, I've done this work. I've sat down. I have goals. I know what I want. I know what I'm good at. Like it's time to go. Like I can't wait for that moment. And Yes, that is, you need that in order to be incentivized to do things. But at the end of the day, to, to, to your quote from the episode, it's like the universe, people, markets, industries, luck can only respond to what you do. Like manifestation, manifestation as a topic is just life reacting to what you do. But I think we've got it the other way. Sometimes we're like, we're like, well, I will just react to what life gives me. And because I have good intentions and a good work ethic, then eventually, you know, this thing that I want will manifest. And I just don't think that's accurate. I think you've really, really got to put out some volume and shout it from a mountain as often and realistically as possible. And then you'll get somewhere like, absolutely. And I think we've got to be pragmatic about it. Like, I think we've really got to think about who we're trying to serve and what that looks like, especially in a, in a, crowded market, like podcasting, everyone has a podcast. There's more podcasts than ever. Um, it's tough. It's tough to, to break out. So I think really the only thing that separates one person from another in podcasting for one is consistency. And then two is your thing. Like, what is your thing? Um, and, and how do you stick to that thing when you're tempted to be like someone else or to emulate someone else? I think that, you know, for me, I always joke that I, I share my feelings for a living. Like that's my thing, a relatable guy sharing his feelings for a living and not deviating from that. You know, I have a publicist, I have an agent, um, and they, they always get on me about my refusal to call myself an expert. I just don't like it. It feels disingenuous. Who, who am I to, to say I'm an expert on this, that, or the other, but that's my thing. And I, and I stay rooted in that both in the way that I carry myself, I suppose, but also in the way that I approach these topics. Like the, my favorite phrase is, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not going to take a stab at something. I don't know. Um, so that, that's my thing, right? I'm very stubborn about that. And I think that's served me really well. Um, and you know, just staying in my lane for 500 episodes, I think is, is, is key and finding a way to make that sustainable. Like, it's not like every day I sit down from zero and I'm like, all right, what am I going to talk about? No, I've, I'm always thinking of things. I've got Google docs on Google docs and notes in my phone of ideas that I've written down over the years and I'm always marinating on them. And then I pick it. Um, you know, I, as a, creator artist whatever you know i think my brain is one of always looking for inspiration i think that's key like if you're going to be a creator a full-time creator or a, a, someone who takes creating seriously you've got to see life through the lens of inspiration um you know how can you be inspired to think differently to challenge something to react to something in a way like i think we need that mentality and i think it's really helpful um you know for me so when i sit down and do the podcast i just I pick from something that inspired me recently that I know I can add value to that. I'm not just going to chop it up and, you know, talk about and repeat the same rhetoric, but how can I offer something different? I mean, really for me, like my thing is I'll take one question, I'll take one topic and I'll beat it up for 20 minutes. I'll repeat myself a lot. Um, and I'll repeat the cliches, but I'll come at it from maybe a different angle or I'll ask a, a question that has really helped me lots of I statements. Um, and that's been, you know, really powerful, but yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, consistency, you know, a willingness to put something out that doesn't do well and a willingness to, to try again when it doesn't do well. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, I'm fortunate to do decent on Instagram, for instance, but like sometimes the algorithm blesses and sometimes it takes away. And when it takes away, it could take away for months. And you're, you're questioning yourself, like, what's the point of doing this? You know, yeah. it's, uh, it's frustrating, uh, but you've got to, you know, go back to that reason why, and then go back to the numbers and go back to understanding that, manifestation or attracting, creating, or whatever. It's all about reacting the world, people, industries reacting to what you do. And if you're not doing, you know, you're not, you're not conspiring anything in your favor. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, you, you kind of just made me think of a, a thought there around, you know, like when we were kids, right. You were so scared to raise your hand in class because 
you know, oh, I don't want to ask this question, but reality, again, half the class or more had that question. I've kind of taken this approach and maybe, maybe you've, just, you've probably done the same with what you put out of like leading, being the one not afraid to ask the question and to put that content out, that information. I'm to, to your point, you mentioned about therapy earlier, the podcast partially, but really it's the blog that I write. That's my therapy. Mm -hmm. And it's being willing to be like, all right, I'll be very vulnerable. I'll share because I know there's other folks out there that probably feel this exact same way. They just are maybe unwilling to share it themselves, but they need to hear it. They need to kind of read it back potentially. So I don't know, that that's kind of the thought I take to it of like, I, I like how you say you're sharing your feelings. It's kind of like someone has to lead because a lot of folks, just like I was, you know, pre-2017, I was scared as hell to put myself out there. I was scared to even do anything that kind of lit me up because what are people going to think? And once you kind of get past that, you're like, oh shit, like no one really cares actually. Um, so just yeah. do it anyways, if it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I struggled with that for a long time because I worked in, in technology sales. So I led a sales team for eight years prior and very different mentalities. That is all about hustling, making money, defining yourself by be a closer, boiler room, like Wolf of Wall Street, like that was the vibe. So switching from that to sharing your feelings for a living is, is 180s. And a lot of people poked fun at me, made fun of me. I remember when I was doing it concurrently with that job, someone would ask me about it and I would downplay it. I'd be like, oh, I don't, I don't really care about that. That's not important to me. That's just something silly I do. Where that wasn't true at all. I cared about it a lot, but I, I hid from it because of exactly what you said, judgment, um, skepticism, you know, the, the whole thing. Um, and you know, I, I, a lot of times I hear people say things like, you know, people, people aren't looking at you like you think they are like, people don't care about what you're doing. I think that's true to an extent. Like, I, I think most people are too busy with their own lives to really care, but I think people do notice what you're doing and people do hate on it. And I try to live in the, in the lane of so what, they literally know nothing about my why. Like, they don't know anything about why I do what I do or what it means to me. And I come back to that for one, I think I find that to be motivating and that's where my why is because it, it's mine. Mm -hmm. It is mine. No one else can take it from me. Everyone in life is just doing what they think is expected of them hundred percent. And if I could break free from that in some sense, it really fills me with a sense of conviction and motivation um, to do that. And that's what keeps me going. But I think, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't really necessarily encourage people to like create an identity around what they do. Cause I think that could be a slippery slope when things aren't going well, but I certainly think you need to be comfortable in the, in the person who sits behind hitting publish. Like you've got to be comfortable with being that person. Um, because there's value in being that person. Like I am a completely different person since the start of the podcast, 100%. And I'm so much better for it. Um, but I never would have known that if I had given up early or I had let some of the, you know, poking fun of case being a influencer or a, you know, feelings sharer. Um, so yeah, I, I think again, full circle, but you've got to find a reason that the thing that you're creating benefits you. Yeah. Um, and when you find that, I think you're going to be drawn to just continue to do it. Well, it also goes back to you talking about the comparison stuff, you know, the 10% or whatever, yeah. like it, it's, that's that whole, you know, the man in the arena speech, which I think you know, everyone enjoys that. It's like, who's shouting at you saying that you're not good enough. Are they even creating like, what, why is it even beneficial? Like, why am I giving it any air or attention? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. They're not, they're not in the game. Um, and that's likely where their, their, you know, hate comes from like the whole recently, like this whole thing about blue checks on Instagram has really got me thinking about that. Like the people who are making the noise about it are a lot of people who don't have blue checks and they're just haters. They're haters because they never had the, the gall to go out and create and try to become, you know, notable for something like it, it comes from people who are not in the game. It comes from people who are on the couch commenting on people who had the courage to try um, and you know, I, I never try to create conversations about like you versus other people, but like some people just don't get it. And they're always going to see you through the lens of their own inadequacy, their own fear, their own insecurity, their own unwillingness to try or be misunderstood. So I think, I think that means something in this day and age. Like I just released a book and I talked a lot about the topic that has gotten a lot of momentum lately, the idea of mimetic theory and mimetic desire and how there's very, very few things in life that we're doing that we weren't influenced to do that we're kind of just robot mode with timelines and goals and aspirations. I think any time you can say, I've taken the time to examine why I'm doing this. I have a personal why I have experience that gives me why I think you're, you're, you're setting yourself 
so far from other people that that's something always to be proud of to say this is mine there was no mimicking there was no social psychology at play here i'm doing this because it means something to me i think that's rare and it's something to be proud of yeah. well let's talk about that a little bit because i'm assuming most people that listen to this podcast are in the they want to do something they're creating they're not in the hating category hopefully nice uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to, I want to go back, uh, quickly, if you can maybe share a little bit, you know, I had Mike Lewis on who wrote this great book called when to jump and kind of talking about this plan in place. Can you share just a little about, um, your jump? You know, you mentioned, Hey, two years ago, you left, you're kind of doing this full time mm -hmm. now. How did you get, was there a certain number you had in place? Hey, I have to have certain saved up or, Hey, I have to have a certain amount of you know, I don't know, listeners or sponsorship, mm -hmm. coming in. anything that you could share of like how you structured, I know it'll be different than everyone else's, but maybe some things for folks to think about if they are looking to jump. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, there's certainly, I wasn't, I certainly wasn't sitting there and be like, all right, here's the game plan. When I hit this, I go, because everything was happening so fast, especially in 2020, I released my first journal in 2020. And that was my first form of monetization. Truly, like I didn't monetize the podcast in any sense, never did a single sponsor, in fact, until the last couple of months here. So oh. <laughs> I'm unmonetized for almost five years. Um, but I mean, the long and short of my entrepreneurial journey is releasing those journals went from zero dollars to almost six million in the first 18 months. Like it was crazy. Oh. And I, I don't say numbers like that to, to be cool. I learned a lot, made a lot of mistakes. Um, you know, learned a lot. I didn't know anything about shipping and fulfillment and manufacturing and costs and anything like that. So I certainly learned a lot over that period. And I think luck played a role in, you know, mid to late 2020, there was a lot of demand for wellness products considering everything that was going on in the world. Um, but I was still working that, that job. Um, but you know, for me, it, it, it proved the business model which I think is important because the business model of like influencing or podcast sponsorship that I'm not so, I'm not so convinced of that as like a sustainable model. Like, yeah, it works, but it, it only works if you're able to find those sponsors. But for me, when I was looking at like my ability to make an income through building a brand, that was something that I had more control over. It, it put all the control in, in my hands. And that was what I was looking for. Like, how can I prove a model that I can control um, that has proven metrics? You know, I ran that business for a year and a half before I decided to leave. Um, and how can I use that to be the proof point that, you know, I can leave and have control over these different elements of the business and that can provide for me as opposed to, yeah, if this sponsor renews and this one renews, then yeah, I'm good to go, but something that I can actually control. So that was what I was really looking for in the form of like personal leverage, things that I can control. Plus of course, the leap of faith that when things don't go well, I can pivot and, and do well. Um, so yeah, so, I mean, I, I left um, that job after, you know, taking the business from zero to, you know, mid seven figures pretty quickly. Um, but then a lot happened in, in advertising and, and a lot happened in the industry that really, uh, made that a challenge from there. Um, but yeah, that was, that was the game plan. I think it was really backed by patience. Again, it was just that idea. The, the one thing I did do well was have the foresight to know, to not leave too early just because I, I, you know, I remember working you know, jobs in Chicago, when I first moved to Chicago, making like 30 grand a year, I was not making any money. And I just, I knew what it was like to not have that leverage. And I knew the mentality that comes with it of, I need to do this. I need to do this. Like I need to, I need to survive. I need to provide. And I just knew within the scope of something that I was passionate about, that I was building that, that those two mentalities could not coexist. So I was just very patient, um, with, you know, building the, the leverage. So I could say no, so I could say yes and, you know, everything in between. Um, and it took a long time. I mean, it took, you know, two and a half years of, of doing everything on the side until, you know, the right moment and randomness and luck and COVID and, you know, having the ability to work at home as well for, you know, those, those years running a sales team from home and be realized how much free time I truly had and I could put into the business. So it just, you know, made me more serious and yeah. And then fast forward, the rest is history. Do you remember the, the day you thought about quitting or maybe the day you quit? Like, uh, in terms of, was that like a huge weight off your shoulder? You've been working oh. for a lot of years. Like, <laughs> I mean, I wish I, not to discourage anyone. Uh, it wasn't like the moment that I pictured. I think we all have these pictures in our heads of like, oh, I quit and everyone, and you're like, oh, this is amazing. And then you go and you print money on your, and you go to your money tree and things are just great. Um, it wasn't so much that it was just gradual. It was just, you know, gradually for one, 
saying, oh, maybe I don't have to do this. And then the business wasn't doing great that I was working at. The economy was having some effects. So eventually I was like, why not just try now? Why not just go and do it? But even like the day I quit, I, even then I remember talking to my mom, um, who she didn't mean it when she said it like this, but she made a comment about throwing it away. She made a comment about, oh, you're going to do that. You threw away eight years at this company going from, you know, uh, account executive to vice president. You're throwing that away. And she didn't mean it like that. I was like, oh man, what if I am throwing it away? Like, what if I just made a really bad decision? Because when you leave a sales role where your value is your Rolodex and what you've done and who you know in the region that you work, it's kind of tough to get back if you take off a considerable amount of time. Like now that I'm like two years out, if like say something happened, I wanted to go work again, it would be, it would be a challenge. Someone would have to like take a bet on me. Um, so yeah, even like the day I quit, I was like, oh man, did I just make a bad decision? <laughs> and I think every entrepreneur of course faces that they face their own paranoia, their own imposter syndrome. Um, so, but I say that in a really hopeful way. And that I think you're always going to feel doubt, but doubt doesn't mean you made the wrong decision. And I know I made the right decision, but every single day, and I'm two years out from doing that, I feel the same thing. Oh, what if it all comes to an end? What if people stop supporting me? What if I lose my touch? What if I run out of things to talk about? I constantly think about that. But what I realize now is that it's part of the process. Just because I feel the doubt doesn't mean it's accurate. I could challenge that feeling and say, well, that can't be true. Every other time I've done this, that, and the other, here's the things that I do. Here's my commitment. I'm good to go. So I say that in, in a positive way, not to discourage people. Just know that those feelings of doubt are normal. Even on, the, uh, even on that day you've been <laughs> picturing and maybe you know, fantasizing about, it's going to be there. Um, and I think that's healthy. It keeps you on your toes. Okay. Let's you know chat about your mom or just support systems in general. Yeah. Cause I'm sure she meant well by that, you know, yeah. we don't how mother are. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, and obviously you, you share a lot about relationships. You talk about relationships. Um, how have you changed your mind on relationships over the last handful of years? And how have you kind of maybe changed the circles that you run with versus five, 10 years ago? Do those look similar or are those totally different of, of the, how you choose the right people to be in your life? Yeah, I'd say they certainly have changed on the like platonic business friend level. Absolutely. You know, I'm interested in people who are doing audacious things, certainly, because I want to be inspired. Um, you know, I'm, in, I, I'm inspired by people who get it. I'm inspired by people who are willing to do different and be different and chase different. Like that, I think that's really important to me. So I'd say <clears throat> my friend circle has gotten smaller in that respect. And then, you know, the great thing about being vocal about what you're passionate about is it attracts other people who are passionate about things. So I think it's just a co collision effect there, you know, objects in motion, stay in motion and bump into other people in motion. It's become really great to make random, random internet connections that lead to lifelong friendships and, and everything in between. So I'd say certainly, you know, the cliches are true, you know, who you associate with the five people, your, your net worth is your network. The whole thing is true. Absolutely. Um, but I do think it's really important, especially in entrepreneurship, which the cliches are also true. It's very lonely. It can be very alienating. You need to have those people who get it and you can have those conversations with. Um, so yeah, I'd say that's been, you know, really helpful. Um, and as really, you know, I've, I, I think about a lot of limiting beliefs I used to have around like, who am I to, to, to write a book, for instance, or release a journal. There's a million journals. There's a million books. Why would anyone buy mine? And I used to have that mentality a lot until I had some, some good friends who, you know, built some large, large companies say, so just because other people have done it doesn't mean you can't do it. doesn't mean you can't do it in the way that you see fit with a little bit of case, Kenny, you know, pizzazz on it and have that be the difference. So I think my, my network has really helped combat some of the natural imposter syndrome we're talking about here as well. Um, and, you know, just having that support system and being able to vocalize some of the things that I think were, you know, more in tune with keeping inside of us has been super, super important. Yeah. And, and by the way, those people, that, this is one thing I've, it took me a long time to realize those people that have published stuff that are out there, they started from zero. They started for, at some point, they've never written a book. They never wrote an article. Yeah. They never had a podcast. They never did anything. You know, we all kind of were in diapers at one point, right? So it's, <laughs> yeah. They had to create. So, you know, this is one of the things too with um, with social media. I know that's really, I guess, uh, disheartening for a lot of people because they're like, oh, look at all these people creating or doing things. You know, maybe folks look at you and they're like, oh my God, look what Case has been doing. And, oh, he's got lucky breaks. You get the haters, those type of folks. But at the end of the day, they don't know all the work you're doing in the background. 
they don't know all the, like you're saying, I'm sitting, I'm thinking about ideas. I'm trying to, you know, bring about things from old podcast episodes to help in new stuff. Like, you know, that type of stuff that you're doing behind the scenes. That's what I love about having great support systems because people that are cheering for you, knowing, hey, I'm doing the hard work as well. I'm in the arena. I know you're doing the hard work behind the scenes. You might not show it on social media, but it's out there. So I think yeah. having those right people in your life to kind of keep pushing you forward, like, hey, don't get discouraged because you're doing a lot of things that you want to do and that are different and the world needs them. You know? Yeah. I think that's an important point. Like <laughs> the behind the scenes is, is everything. That's where everything happens. Like the, the thing on social media does not matter. That is not the work. Um, maybe there's a couple people whose job truly is social media, the influencers, but I can tell you for one, they're, they're not, they're not, they're not building the businesses that you likely want to build. The businesses that are built are built on the back end with the work that's put in the boring stuff, the boring stuff, the stuff that, yeah, you don't publish on social media because it's boring. Um, that is where the real action happens. And that's where the real business model presents itself. Like for me, like I don't make money from social media, like social media is a way to get eyes and ears onto the things that I'm good at and passionate about that lead me to, to make money and monetize and actually build a business. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes it's easy to judge yourself based on the, the outer appearance, but we need to give ourselves credit for the things behind the scenes. And I think, yeah, to your point, having the support system of people who get that, who understand the unsexiness of even the business I'm in, which on the service, people are like, oh my gosh, case, that's so great. You just get a ride and talk all day and post on social media. Yeah, it's a privilege. Absolutely. But that is like very, <laughs> that is not what goes into it really. Um, and I think you know, having people who get that is so important. Yeah. Well, what about, I want to talk about journaling maybe, and this could, we can kind of you know, end on this. Cause I think we could probably go deep down the rabbit hole, but why, obviously you're, you're creating journals is journaling a big part of your life. Is that something you've done for a long time or. Well, it's one of those things. Yeah. It's a good topic because you talk about like, why do you build a product? You should build a product that you want, that you would use, and perhaps that you haven't been able to find the version that is most useful for you. So for me, many, many years ago, I was like, I would love to journal. Everyone I, I talk to talks about how powerful journaling is and how you need to get up in the morning and journal. And I was like, all right, I'll become a journaler. And I would go out and I would buy every journal I can get my hands on. And for me, I never really, they never didn't really work for me. I found that they, they were one of two categories. They were either too open to stream of consciousness, to, um, you know, just, uh, just put your thoughts in here, stream of consciousness. What are you feeling today? It was to that. I'm a little too ADD for that. Or it was like, it made me more stressed to journal. Cause it was like, all right, five goals for the day, come back at lunch, talk about your process, your progress at the end of the day, come back and do this. So it felt too prompted or too unprompted. And I was like, huh, you know, personally, I would like something that probably sits in the middle of that, that I, I hadn't been able to find a version of that, that worked. So that was the impetus for me to create a journal that I would use something that takes 10 minutes a day. You could do any time of day. It wasn't a productivity journal, um, but it wasn't uh, just share your emotions journal. It was the challenging journal that kept you accountable, but did it in a simple way. That was a good mix of prompted and unprompted. That was the whole Genesis. And I created that and that is how everything started. And from there, yes, voracious journaler, because I've realized the power of questions not just the power of writing down what you want to hear. Cause I think a good journal is a combination of, you know, checking yourself. Where are we? Where's your head out today? Let, let's just at least let's get where we are at. And then hitting you with a very hard bespoke custom question that gets you thinking that is the value of journaling. And that is, that is mindfulness. All mindfulness is, is, you know, a compassionate challenging of the assumptions you've made to date an exposing of what you don't know, the challenging of what you do know. And I think really the only way to do that is with very specific questions that go beyond five things you're grateful for. What do you want out of life? Who are you? How do you feel? Cause I think we're very wired to just repeat the same things or tell ourselves the things we want to hear. I think a good journal makes you uncomfortable in a sense. Uh, and empowers you to go out and live that. So that's been my whole thing with journals and I've created quite a few based on different topics, but I just re I realized the power of a good question, um, which sounds simple, but I think, you know, the reason for products should be simple. Yeah. And yeah, that, that's, been, that's, that's been the genesis of it. Like I've just realized how, you know, the, how powerful the right question at the right time can be in life. If someone's listening in, what question should they be asking themselves today? Like they're only going to write one question down. What would you encourage them to, to think about? 
Um, I mean, I, I have a lot of, of prompts around that around like identity. Like I think the, the most foundational ones are like, who do you want to be? But defining yourself by verbs, you talk about manifesting earlier. Like I like the exercise that I, I borrow from um, habit formation, which is like, I'm the kind of person who, and then you complete that with as many verb statements as possible. Cause I think our inclination when we say like, who do you want to be? Or what's your goal in life? Most of us say, I just want to be happy. I want to be successful. I think that's a challenge because that's a very ambiguous statement and it's difficult to be that person at all times. And when we're not the person we want to be, we tend to devolve and blame ourselves and guilt ourselves and do all these things. But a statement like I'm the kind of person who, and then you list out these statements for one, it gives you verbs to do. And two, it gives you credit for what you're doing and it keeps you going. Um, so something as simple as that, I think is really powerful. That's one that I, I try to do as often as can, as I can, even amidst moments where I, I'm not happy or I'm not feeling successful. I sit down and say, I'm the kind of person who it reminds me of what I've been doing and it keeps me accountable for what I need to do. And it inspires me. Maybe it'll give me an idea. If I say I want to be successful, what does that mean? First of all, we need to define success, but also what are the things I'm doing that will make me successful? Let's forget the adjectives. I don't like adjectives. I like verbs. And instead of I want to be successful, so no, I'm the kind of person who does what he says he's going to do. I'm the kind of person who is willing to reach out to someone and start an awkward conversation. I'm the kind of person who commits to doing 100 episodes or whatever it may be. I feel, find that kind of thing really invigorating. And often if we're at a point where we have a goal, but we don't have verbs that align with it, it's a great opportunity to actually create a plan, a plan of attack. Um, so again, my, my whole thing with mindfulness is it's like action oriented, like there, there's value, of course, in being self-aware. Um, but self-awareness without action is, I don't want to say meaningless, but where does it lead you? You know, the whole point of being intentional and, you know, tr looking inside and doing inner work is to manifest in, in outer work in actions in doing different and doing better and doing simpler, whatever it may be. So I think a good journal gets you honest, but gets you action oriented. And, um, for me, that's just kind of what I've always tried to create and, you know, really what I gravitate towards personally. Well, I think it's a nice loop back to, you know, life reacts to what we do. We have to, we, it's, it's one thing to say, Hey, I want to journal. It's another thing to put some time in, even if it's one minute a day, right. Even you don't have to, you know, make yourself a bath. You don't have to put candles on, <laughs> you know, it's like. Yeah. Just journal, pick out it's yeah. like I journal at nighttime before bed. I don't know about you. Like yeah. that's, that's what works for me. Yeah. Right. Some other people, maybe they do it. Maybe they're thinking about the question when they're on a walk. Like it doesn't matter. It's the fact that you put some time and energy and build. Yeah. It's funny you say that. Cause I used to be like very anti self-help. So like, Oh, do I need to get some robes and some yeah. crystals <laughs> and align my chakras? Like, what does that mean? Mindfulness is the most practical thing in the world. Recently, I've been referring to it as brute force mindfulness, which is just introspection that gives you so much incentive to take action that you can't help but do things differently or better or more in tune, whatever it may be. That is mindfulness. And like to your point about when and where, it does not matter. In fact, I'm working with a fitness brand right now to create a mindfulness journal that you use in the gym, like in between sets. Like there is, there is no defined parameter for when you can or should be mindful or practice mindfulness. Mindfulness is literally just introspection. It's the, the, the question of why and the answer of why. And when I look at it that way, it's much more practical than being like, oh, mindfulness is energy and energy is healing. It's like, yeah, sure. Those, those are elements of it. And I love people who take a more spiritual approach to mindfulness. But for me, mindfulness is literally just getting honest with yourself and allowing that honesty to lead to actions that are aligned with the honesty, as opposed to copying, borrowing, rushing, impatience, whatever it may be. So for me, it's, you know, it's, it's the most practical thing in the world. Uh, and I, well, usually when I journal, I, I listen to house music, upbeat dance music. Like I'm not sitting here, you know, with classical music on, that's just my style. And I yeah. think people, you know, can find freedom in broadening their definition of mindfulness. So it doesn't become a hokey cliche thing. It becomes just a powerful action oriented thing that gives you clarity. That is the point of, of journaling mindfulness to give you clarity. So obviously very passionate about this. That's awesome. And, and your new it's the new journal is called that's bold of you, right? Is that the new journal? Uh, that's actually just a book. Uh, oh, that was my that's first book. Oh, that was that. my first book book. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, All right. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, it's got the essence of a journal, but okay. it's in a, in a book form. Um, but yeah, all my, all my other journals are like journal journals. Um, but again, I, I've kind of 
taken a little bit of different approach to journals. There's a lot of journals out there where <laughs> it's just like the same page over and over again. Yeah. My journals usually are uh, different prompts every day, of course, uh, but also a little bit of perspective alongside of it, a couple paragraphs of something to consider. I, I've just found, you know, sometimes when we're stuck in our heads, a question, a question's a question. We'll give it the same answer we've always given it, or we'll avoid the honest answer. But you add a little bit of perspective from someone like myself or like you could be an aha moment. Just the way that someone says something, it could break you free of the same thing, the same thing, or aversion to honesty. So that's why, like, for me, my form of journaling, it's like a hybrid. It's kind of like prose plus journal, just a little bit. And, you know, that is the push that sometimes I think we need to finally be honest with ourselves. Yeah. Well, and I'll link all this up in the, the show notes, but uh, yeah, Case, I appreciate you, you joining on here. I, I love your stuff online. And, you know, one of the things I like about a lot of the content you put out, it definitely, even for me, again, I'm doing a lot of different stuff here, but it always makes me think, I'm like, okay, this is a different perspective. Like, you, I like how you come at it from a different angle, that mindfulness, really thinking about not just the generic crap you kind of see all over, right? <laughs> so I, I do like how you're thoughtful about it and, and, and things that I think most of us think about but we don't want to give too much air to because again, it's a little uncomfortable at times. So again, I, I appreciate all the, the stuff that you're putting out there and it's good to see that you're doing well, man. Well, appreciate that. Right back at you. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's where the win is. It's in the discomfort. It's in the cliche. It's in the, in the doing the work. So, you know, guys like us, I, I think uh, it helps us grow and it helps other people. So that's a win-win. It's a privilege to be able to do it. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Case, for joining. Any uh, last comments, thoughts, insights where people can check you out if it's other places than, you know, like Instagram or website or anything? Or... Uh, no, that, that's pretty much it. I mean, the podcast is New Mindset Who Dis, New Mindset Who Dis dot com for, for journals and books. And uh, Instagram is, is where it's at. But uh, yeah, no, I appreciate you giving me time. I think really for me, I'm uh, passionate about creating a movement around mindfulness. I'm releasing a new project uh, in the coming weeks that it's kind of it's like the idea is like it's bigger than me. It's bigger than case. It's not just case. It's a community around people who are passionate about taking time every day to create mindfulness in their lives, intentional mindfulness, even when it doesn't feel good, even when it's not convenient. I've just found I just turned 35. Just, uh, you know, the, the value of slowing down, like forcing yourself to slow down. Because yeah. I think we're, especially as you get older, you're just wired, you're just wired to go the same pace. I think slowing down is, is such a gift. Stillness, it's my favorite word. Uh, it's a gift. And um, so soon we'll be seeing some more uh, for me uh, on, the, on that topic. I usually, I won't shut up about the things I'm passionate about. So I'll be talking about stillness a lot moving forward. <laughs> Dude, I love, you know, I, I've been, you know, into stoicism. I actually got my uh, memento mori. Tattoo. Oh yeah. No, stoicism right there, that, yeah. So, oh my yep. God. So yeah, I, I feel you on that. Well, uh, yeah, again, man, I appreciate you coming on. Thanks so much for uh, for joining and uh, and taking some time out of your day, man. Yeah, thanks for having me.